Hello, here we are again. Welcome back to Reads with Rachel. Okay, we're here to talk about Light Lark, so let's do that. Light Lark. <sighs> Oh boy. Okay, today we have another Did It Deserve One Star, the series where I review a book that got one star bombed on Goodreads. When an author does something that upsets people, people tend to one star en masse, and then I tell you if it deserved, from a craft standpoint, all of those one stars. Oh, <gasps> okay. If you're not familiar with the events that led people to being upset enough with this author to one star her book, I have an entire video on that. It is linked down below. You're welcome. Today's video is brought to you by My Potato Search Marxist, which is tier three on my Patreon. On. They got to see this video before you guys did, because that's, that's the perk. <laughs> which seems so small when you think of it. Wow, I'm doing a really good job to market myself, aren't I? And I have to sing, thank you for being a friend to them. And they are Allison, Ebby, Kate, Molly, Sean, Paige, Reba, Shannon, and my newest, Marcella. Hi, I'm still in awe that y'all are still here supporting this channel. Thank you. Uh, if any of you watching want to join the Potato Starch Marxist, link to my Patreon down below, get early access voting on what I read and rant review. Okay, on to the on to the video. If you don't know, Light Lark by Alex Astor is pitched as A Court of Thorns and Roses meets The Hunger Games. That is a lie. Or at least it's not how I would describe it. It's pitched about being an island that appears every hundred years and the six rulers of the six different like factions of this world have to compete to break each of their uh, respective curses and one of them has to die and there's a prophecy that they are like supposed to meet the expectations of and our main character is Isla Crown or Isla Crown I don't know I can't I, I here's the problem with this book she names her main character I think Isla but then she keeps using the word Isle every chapter every other page sorry for the clicking i'm sorry but i'm i'm a dumb bitch i'm i'm a stupid bitch i can't possibly be expected to differentiate between those words our main character i have to call her isla i'm sorry it's just it i'm sorry isla crown is the ruler of the wildling realm there's wildling starling moonling there's six of them who cares and she goes into the competition with a secret she is actually powerless and doesn't want them to find out because she doesn't want them to kill her, right? Uh, she doesn't have a powers of the wildling ruler, has to keep this secret. I'm gonna tell you about the plot, right? But for once, I'm gonna do that nice thing that other reviewers do where they have a spoiler-free review and then they have a spoilery review because I do think that there are people who are still on the fence about whether or not they wanna read this. I'm gonna try to help y'all out by, de by deciding whether or not you wanna read this. Here's the thing, this part of the review is entirely, mm, is mostly subjective because the way that I'm going to tell you whether or not this book will work for you is by comparing it to another book, not Avatar and not The Hunger Games, which I don't think it has anything in common with, another book, which I think it has a lot in common with, because here's the plain and simple of it. So here's the non-spoiler section. I'll let you know when we're getting into the, the nitty gritty, okay? This book is nothing like The Hunger Games not even remotely. In The Hunger Games, everything has a point. Everything is commentary. It is quite a brilliant series, actually. Uh, it is a examination of some things. It is commentary on other things. Uh, Light Lark has sort of a competition, but it is not an intricately woven tale using this competition to make commentary on class structure and capitalism. That is The Hunger Games. What this book is very much like is Caraval by Stephanie Garber, which if you know me, I fucking hate that book. Yes, I read book one. It was just as bad as book two. Please do not recommend that I read book two because I already read it and I think that both of them deserve one star. Terrible. It is my least favorite YA fantasy book of all time. It is so bad. But if you liked Caraval, <laughs> then you should read Light Lark because they have a lot in common. Plain and simple, if you like either book, you're gonna like the other book. So if you liked Light Lark, you should read Caraval because you're gonna enjoy it. And like, good for you if you enjoy it. Nothing against you, like books are obviously subjective. Um, I just think it's, personally, I think they're both terrible for the same reasons. Here's why they're similar. Both books feature god-awful and immature prose, okay? 
real bad. Insta love, that the romance being just so many levels of cringe. A magic system that does not make any fucking sense. A competition that doesn't make any sense. Characters who disappear and are irrelevant to the story and basically just serve as like one dimensional beings who show up whenever the author needs them to do something but then they don't actually add anything to the story other than that. And then twists, this is the big thing they have in common. Twists that occur one after the other in succession that render the com like the previous twist completely moot. So after a while it just starts to feel like you're wasting your time reading because the <laughs> The experience of it gets so like muddled and watered down when this strategy is like one twist after the other that renders the previous one moot is implemented. I think that that's just fucking lazy. Also, um, that's the big one, but I'll, and this one I feel is subjective, very subjective. So just know this going in that this is subjective. I understand every reader goes into a book looking for different things. Personally, what I really like in a book is for the author to almost use their book as a way to have a conversation with the reader around a theme using the journeys of the characters that they've created and the circumstances to convey their takes and maybe deliver a perspective that I had not previously thought of before. Both of these books do not do this. There is no point, there is no theme, there is no conversation, there is no perspective. So I get pretty bored. Again, I acknowledge that is a me thing and it doesn't have to be a you thing. So if you don't go into books looking for that, proceed. You will have a probably a good time. Um, but if you are a person that does like conversations surrounding themes, like uh, like Ember in the Ashes, if you like what Ember in the Ashes does with its conversations on like uh, settler colonialism, right? You will probably not like Caraval, which doesn't really make sense why Saba to hear. <laughs> why did she blur light lark. I'm so confused. <laughs> anyway, we all have bad takes once in a while. Uh, so again, I, I, I know that that is not an objective thing that makes a book good or bad. The take within the book can make the good the book good or bad, but the, the presence of having a conversation surrounding a topic or theme uh, does not necessarily make a good uh, a good or bad book. Uh, let me go into a little bit more detail on, on the prose. So like when I complain about the prose being immature in both books, I mean it's ridiculous. I don't mean that it's young because you can, I like middle grade, right? The Jumbies by Tracy Baptiste, which is over there, <laughs> is a good book with prose that is meant for younger readers yet is not ridiculous. It is not immature in its um, conveying of themes. It's not immature in its conversation surrounding things. It's not stupid. My three-year-old's home. Kill me. In this book and Caraval, in Light Lark and Caraval, both books can feel sort of young. We switch back and forth weirdly in both books where it's like this feels a lot older than the previous chapters, this feels a lot younger than the previous chapters. It's very odd. It, it sort of gives you whiplash. Like who was this book written for? I'm sure you've seen Alex's use of, uh, in the discourse surrounding this book, Alex's use of words like yokey thing yoke is used to describe uh, the sun multiple times as well as her use of meanly that does get used quite a bit and uh whenever somebody uses something repeatedly I tend to pick up on it like recently when I read Rebecca Mix's book uh she used pale to describe people quite a bit and I've had issues with that before with even in one of my favorite books Lightbringer by Claire Legrand, she also used the word pale and when people tend to repeat things over and over, I pick up on that. I don't remember Caraval using the same term, I just remember Caraval using weird terms to describe things, whereas Alex was using the same ridiculous terms, yokey, meanly, over and over. Caraval at one point <laughs> described things and I would just shake my head like one time she described something as tasting acidic and moldy and burnt. How can something be all three. I do actually have a review on Caraval. It was one of the first videos I did on this channel, so be gentle <laughs> if you choose to watch it. But I think it might be time for me to reread books one and two and do new reviews and then actually finally finish book three. So if you're interested in seeing me do that, you can comment down below. Uh, now the other thing that this was compared to was A Court of Thorns and Roses, and it really depends on what element of that we are making a comparison to. Are we actually talking about like book one, A Court of Thorns and Roses? Are we talking about the series as a whole? There are some trials that Farrah goes through in book one. I guess that could kind of be compared to this. Farrah 
Sarah doesn't have powers when she's going through those trials. Isla doesn't have any power. There's a comparison to be made there, sure. Uh, if you're looking for a world where all the rulers are separated by like the different powers that they have and then being tied to certain things like night and uh, daytime and stars and what else is there? And they got snow and uh, uh, shit like that, sun. Uh, yeah, that, that there's a comparison to be made there. But I feel like both in <laughs> A Court of Thorns and Roses, the first book, and in Light Lark, those are pretty light on being explored, so the, I, at least it's a an apt comparison. The world building isn't really fantastic in either book. Uh, or are we comparing it to A Court of Mist and Fury because Light Lark's love interest is a knockoff resand? In that case, you're gonna be disappointed. Uh, it really depends on what you're looking for and what that comparison means, which I don't know. I think the comparison that I have made between this this book and Caraval is much more on point than Akatar and definitely more so than the Hunger Games. I What does this book have in, in common with the Hunger Games other than like having a young woman main character? Honestly, I don't know. Again, it is way more Caraval and all of this to say that I think that Caraval is a really bad book, bad prose, bad relationships, bad characters, and for all those reasons I gave Caraval one star back when I read it in like 2018 and for the same reasons that I gave Caraval one star, I would give Light Lark one star. So if you like Caraval, read it. If you don't like Caraval, don't. That's my advice to you. Let's get to the spoilery, spoilery part of the video because uh, I have so many things to say. Like I just, I think that I'm going to insert here a clip of let's get ready to rumble. I have so much to say. So let's get into it. Um, we open on Isla Crown who is in Wildling Realm and she is the um, self insert for sure for this author down to like the description and the fact that this main character likes to sing that randomly got thrown in. Alex Astor is also a singer and I'm not saying that all self inserts are bad but I've never seen a good one. She's the ruler of the Wildling Realm. Uh, she lives on the Wildling New land. Everybody used to live on Light Lark, but then there are now some of them don't. And the synopsis is, I feel like, sort of misleading. The island only appears once every hundred years. That's not really true. The island is only accessible every hundred years to those who don't already live on it. So, uh, it's already feeling kind of caravally, am I right? <laughs> Anyway, it starts out saying, Isla Crown often fell through puddles of stars and into faraway places. And I know what you're thinking, what? Uh, it turns out Isla Crown, despite being a ruler, has no powers, so she gets locked in her room by her caretakers because her caretakers are like, oh, we don't want anybody in the realm finding out you don't have any powers. But she gets out of her room by using this thing called a star stick to sort of like portal out. Now, what is a star stick? I'm so glad that you asked. It is a stick that apparently allows her to draw a puddle of stars and then teleport through that. You may be wondering, what does such a thing look like? That is a that is a great question. Beats the fuck out of me because Alex never described it. So my brain decided to fill in the gaps. And the first thing that came to my mind was this, which is a child's bubble wand from Disney World belonging to my children. Um, so every time the uh, main character draws a puddle of stars with her star stick, I'm imagining this. Which, by the way, yeah, it does light up. It's great. I mean, that's what I assume Alex meant for me to see since she didn't dispute it at any point in the book by describing it. So, uh, however, I suppose you could also substitute it with these Star Wars vibrators or the spear stick from Cheer It On, as a bunch of people put in my comments on TikTok. Uh, thank you for that, by the way. That was hilarious. Other recommendations that people put out were uh, the Sailor Moon wand, which I wasn't allowed to watch Sailor Moon growing up, so. Damn. Growing up fundy. Just fundy things, am I right? And Isla is about to go to the Centennial. Like, she's literally about to hop through a, you know, puddle of stars using her star stick and hop into the Centennial. Then we get a bunch of explanations for the world that we're in. 500 years before each of the six realms, <sighs> Wildling, Starling, Moonling, Skyling, Sunling, and Nightshade uh, were cursed. Their strengths turned into their own personal poisons. Each curse was uniquely wicked. Wild Lynx was twofold. They were cursed to kill anyone they fell in love with and to live exclusively on human hearts. They turned into terrifyingly beautiful 
monsters with the wicked power to seduce with a single look. So as you can see, we're like starting out and it seems like we're going to have a conversation about that um, spicy Latina seductress stereotype that is used in media. Uh, an, ex an example of this I can give you is like Gloria from Modern Family. Uh, an example I can also give you fuck of this is you know the entire conversation we just had about Kate Stewart <laughs> recently which I will link down below so love has been like banned you're not allowed to love in the wildling realm because otherwise you're gonna have to kill your your love I feel like maybe she was attempting to have a conversation about stereotypes in the beginning and then she sort of lost that train of thought Alex Astor says that she also has indigenous heritage and she says things like the rest of the realms like to view wildlings as savages so that's a stereotype about indigenous folks so I feel like there was an attempt at the beginning to try to have a conversation about stereotypes against um, Latina women and about indigenous people, but then that just sort of falls off very quickly and doesn't happen anymore. So I'm not really sure why that was in there at all. All right, so she portals to the Centennial on Light Lark, the island, and she gets there and immediately she sees uh, Grimdark, who is quite clearly Walmart resand. Isla could feel her face get hot beneath his gaze. He, he's like, call me Grim Isla, because his name is Grimdark, which is hilarious. And she says to him, have we met before? Because she suddenly feels like he's familiar. And he says, if we had, it would have been more than once. Okay. Anyway, so he immediately starts hitting on her. Um, and I'm just going to spoil it for you right now. They knew each other all along. She just doesn't remember. I don't understand what the plan was in that case because I don't really get why he would erase her memories just to hit on her the whole time. I What was the fucking point? I don't know. What was the point of any of this? Anyway, we'll get there. That's literally at the very end. Um, so they had a romantic involvement, hoo hoo, uh, that I don't care about before the events of this book. Okay? Okay. But she doesn't remember that and you don't know that until the end of the book. It's been this whole book hearing him want to bone her and him, her being like, oh, he's so hot, but I shouldn't pay attention to that. It's like, oh my god, just fuck. Just get it out of your system. I'm so tired. She explains, nightshades had the power to spin curses, making them prime suspects for creating the curse in the first place, right? So, you know immediately we're like let's try to figure out who sh who spun this curse and this is something she's going to do the whole book and do it so badly in order to try to throw you off of her trail right if you don't know how to write intrigue like that and try to throw a reader off don't try don't do that it's a mess because as per usual, I predicted everything that was going to happen. I knew who the bad guy was. I literally texted it to my friend. I was reading the book and I was like, I bet it's redacted. And sure enough, as usual, I was right. Okay, so Sunlings, which the king of Lightlark has Sun, he's a Sunling, but he's also an origin. So he has like a bunch of powers. I don't know. It's really convoluted and stupid. Sunlings have been cursed to never be in the brightness of day, but that doesn't seem to like really put a damper on their powers because like everybody's so overpowered in this. She lets you know that if something were to happen to the king of Lightlark, that the entirety of Lightlark would fall apart. And that's would be bad because people live there. Unlike the synopsis makes it seem, am I right? Okay, so then she meets Celeste, right? She gets to the, the Light Lark Island Centennial. She meets Oro, the, no, she doesn't meet Oro the King. She meets Grimm, but she doesn't meet him for the first time. Wink, wink. She meets Azul, the Skyling? It doesn't matter, he's a background character. You barely see him. He gets scapegoated once or twice. He's just there for for, well, diversity purposes because he's the only black character and he's also the only gay character. So that's interesting. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a choice. Um, you rarely see him. You meet Celeste, who is the moonling? Starling. Starling ruler. And I think you also meet, what is her name? Oh god, it doesn't matter because she gets vilified the whole book even though it's obvious that she's not the villain. The moonling leader whose name I can't remember and I don't care about. But then Isla goes to her room where she's going to be staying for the next hundred days and Celeste comes to her room and they're like, hee 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 hee, oh my god, we fooled them, we're actually buddies, we've been friends this whole time because a 
allegedly the star stick is a starling thing, right? Except it's not. It's let known at the end that it's actually a nightshade relic. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and ask. I'm, I'm very confused about this magic because we have starling nightling so like stars night but then we also have sun stars are suns it's like how is this magic is so stupid and convoluted i hate it anyway so they're like we fooled them we're friends i love that it has a tail right now because I can't find the bottom of it. Anyway, the star stick is allegedly from um, Celeste's kingdom and then she like portaled into Celeste's kingdom and Celeste was like, let's be friends. So then you find out that Celeste and Isla have a plan. Isla's uh, caretakers, jailers, uh, sent her to Lightlark with another plan. She's like, I don't like that plan. I have a plan with my BFF Celeste. We two boss girls are going to get in here and we're gonna find this thing called the bond breaker which is a giant needle with a point on both sides that apparently if you bleed all of your blood out it will lift a curse but if the both of us both bleed our blood out then we won't die and both of our curses will be lifted and then we can go home what? Uh, we start getting her weird descriptions where uh, she starts saying things like, the sun had fallen. It was just a yoki thing, halfway consumed by the horizon. Ridiculous. Uh, she also uh, falls off of her balcony and the king of light lark saves her and then doesn't talk to her. Okay. Anyway, I didn't know what the point of all, any of that was until the literal end. Their relationship confused the shit out of me until the literal end and I was thrown for a fucking loop. More on that in a minute. And it says, Oro, king of light lark, ruler of sunlinks. He had hair like woven gold, eyes as amber and yellow. What? hollow as honeycomb. Mean eyes that pinned her in place. She really likes the word mean or meanly to describe things and I'm like man please this is bad. It's just not good writing. I mean Stephanie Garber would probably like this. Oh that was spicy. Sorry. She really also likes to describe whatever Isla's wearing, which cool, another very care of all thing. Uh, actually a thing that in Akatar would have, you know, would have the girlies being interested, I suppose. One gown was the dark blue of sapphires with crystal shaped shards cut out of its sides. And I'm like, what is the shape of a crystal? One was the purple of fresh lavender with an eye rollingly low cut bodice and skin tight pants. And I was like, no, I have the monopoly on eye rolling here, ma'am. Don't you dare. So on the fifth day of the centennial, we have the first demonstration. Yeah, there's demonstrations. This one is just so, it's so goofy. All of them are so goofy. Grim, Grim Dark's first, uh, first up to choose like the um, showcase, which by the way, all of these like little tests that they do have absolutely no point. Whereas in the Hunger Games, the showcasing of powers does have a point because you're trying to market yourself essentially to rich people who are going to watch you die. And so you have a better chance of living if you market yourself better in those little talent showcases, right? And the thing about like in, in the first Hunger Games books that's so cool that Katniss does is she like shirks that and it <laughs> does what she does and then does her little bow and it's like, yes, like fuck capitalism, and am I right? So Grimm is like, how would you guys do without your powers and they sword fight and she wins and it says he was thrilled that she had beaten him which made no sense her eyes narrowed at him never had one anyone's motivations been more of a mystery what did Grimm want what game was he playing bruh he wants to fuck <laughs> It's very obvious that he wants to fuck. He has made it blatantly clear that this man wants to fuck you. I don't get it. What do you mean? Like, if if she had written it so that Grimm had not been trying to fuck her from the moment they met, maybe I would agree. Yeah, I don't know what his motivations are. But at this point, I'm just like, man wants to fuck. What's confusing for you? And later it's like, did he mean to embarrass her or seduce the seductress? It's really obvious that it's the latter. The man wants to fuck. Hello? <laughs> he calls her heart eater. So let's go back to that because part of the wildling curse is that they are cursed to like kill their loves. I, I, also they eat hearts like human hearts that falls off real quick because they're like disgusted that she eats hearts but then like her having t hearts sent to her room for her to eat is like like a throwaway thing because it it stops being a problem after a while 
it's sort of just forgotten forgotten plot line and it leaves you wonder like whose hearts is she is supposed to be eating it says she's like oh i'm gonna have to throw them off the balcony it's just really stupid and forgotten about but the thing about this is that she's like I don't need to win the game, I just need to stick to me and Celeste's plan so that we can find the bond breaker, break our curses, and go home. So I just need to lay low, I don't need to win, I don't need to lose, I don't need to make myself a target, I just need to find the bond breaker. But it's like, you, you don't want to make your, it says she doesn't want to make herself stand out too much, she just wants to skate by mostly unnoticed. How can you skate by mostly unnoticed? You, they think you eat hearts and they hate you for it. It's just weird. So her and Celeste are making these plans, trying to figure out how to get to the bomb breaker they have to find it they think it's in a library they're like but first we have to get into the libraries and you have to be the part of you have to be the ruler to get into the secret parts of the libraries so what we need to make is these gloves and they're made out of human skin and then you have to touch the the you have to get the power from the the other rulers and it will absorb into the gloves and it's like this is so stupid this is so stupid and convoluted there had to be a better way to write this this is nonsense like it's not cool it's just nonsense so they get these skin gloves and Isla starts popping off to one library after the other trying to figure out who's got the bond breaker right the uh, double-sided needle that'll make them bleed their blood out Isla keeps like failing to find the bond breaker She's also just not strategizing other ways, like what if this doesn't work? Why not try like other ways? And she's talked about how like her caretakers have basically like thrown her out in the jungle a few times to try to get her, you know, ready for whatever not Hunger Games the Centennial could throw at her. And none of that is really like necessary other than the sword play. Like I don't really understand why they did any of that because it had nothing to do with the actual tasks of the Centennial, except maybe like the one time where there was this maze. But other than that, like the rest of the rulers didn't need to be thrown out into the jungle by their caretakers in order to get there. So I, don't, I just, I don't don't get it like what was the fucking point really that 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 is that is my sum and whole review of this book what was the fucking point also this author really likes to describe everything as as food like not only is the sun a yolky thing but she describes the ocean as soup and she describes the island as a pastry this book was on track to make me hate food oh cleo that's her name she starts to think that cleo the moonling ruler is the big bad so immediately i'm like no it's not her can't be her because um this is yet another author who writes things where they're just hitting you over the head with information trying to mislead you and doing a really bad job of it they have a couple more task thingies there's like cleo has a maze celeste has a mirror where everybody touches it and they have to face their fear within this like mirror realm and that's how she gets everybody's fingerprints for the human skin magic glove thing one person i can't remember which but was like let's all showcase our powers and this should have been the point when everybody was like clearly Isla doesn't have powers because instead of using her power at all which everybody else did she just throws a throwing star at the king and doesn't kill him I was like how nobody thinks that that's suspicious not a single one of you stupid bitches thinks that this is suspicious she didn't she's never used any wildling power in front of you and you're not suspicious now when the task is use your powers hello there's also like no real rules to this game there's no point to any of these showcases it's not like anybody's voting on who's winning you're really just trying to decide like hey who should die i guess but like you don't have to agree on who should die like one can just decide to kill the other after a certain amount of days it's stupid so then one of the tasks is like it's not tasks it's one of the i don't know showcases is what do all of you have to uh show for yourselves essentially so oro can like i think turn things gold i don't remember uh cleo has like an entire fleet of ships the moonling lady oro can make stuff with wind i think like some sort of messaging system with wind don't know or care what celeste can do and then grimdark being the broody resan knockoff that he is is like my realm has nothing to offer you and then he leaves because there's no rules he can do whatever and anybody can do whatever because this isn't a hunger games this is nonsense and isla not having any powers but thankfully the wilding realm also makes like tonics and elixirs so she sticks her whole fucking arm in a fire and burns it to a crisp and then like pours some shit on it and she's like see healed that's what we have to offer you and still you're like what was the point of this what 
was point. And for some reason, Cleo having a bunch of ships is suspicious. She's like, who is she's trying to infiltrate? And it's like, why would she not have, this is so stupid. Like it says, in the end, Azul won. Won what? What did he win? <laughs> There is no winning. It's just like, you're the winner. Here's your gift certificate to Olive Garden or some shit. Like, it's completely irrelevant to the centennial. So it, it keeps saying that, like, Isla is a great strategizer, str strategic person. And it's like, no, she's not. Everything constantly goes wrong. And you're just watching her fail up a hill the whole time. It's nonsensical. Despite being thrown out in the wilderness, you know, to like learn how to save herself, she doesn't do shit correctly. Everything goes wrong all the time. And then I'm supposed to care or think that she's like this great strategist in, in like the games that I don't care about. It's so fucking weird. All right, let me summarize the rest, shall we? Because I'm sick of looking at my notes. We are on this path where she's like, I think it's Cleo. I think it's the moonling lady. She has ships. She goes to Cleo's Isle because not only is there the Island of Lightlark, there's Isles separate for like the different kingdoms. Hers is empty. Cleo's is like not empty. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. Uh, so she goes to Cleo's library and she hears that Cleo has like a whole massive like army, right? So she's like, clearly it's Cleo. Cleo did this. Cleo's the one. And you're like, no, clearly not because this is all in your head. You've never had a conversation with the bitch except for once at the beginning of the book where you guys were like mean girling each other. It cannot possibly be this woman. There is no evidence this is so heavy-handed. This is so stupid. So then Oro the king, the sun king, who I'm picturing as like a 50-year-old man, right? He's like 600 years old, just like the rest of them, except for Isla, who's like 19 or whatever. Well, apparently I was wrong, but this entire time I'm picturing him as a 50-year-old man. He approaches her and he's like, hey, I don't like you or trust you, but I pick you to be my partner. There's partners later in the game, right? And he's like, listen, here's the deal. There is something that I know about called the heart of the the island and I think if we find it we can win the games break the curses and she's like oh okay cool and so she's like I'll do this and still try to find the bond breaker with Celeste which is not going well because she's terrible at strategies like she is the absolute fucking worst she's really fucking bad at it so her and Oro the king they become friends ish no. Her and Oro, he picks her to be his partner because there's partners later in the game. Uh, what for? I don't know. Apparently you have to partner up to try to break the curse or whatever. Uh, even though the... Here's the thing. You know what this reminds me of? This book reminds me of the TV show, which this might be way after some of your time. Um, <laughs> whose line is it anyway? Where everything's made up and the points don't matter. That's this, that's this book. Everything is made up and nothing matters. The points do not matter. The games, the trials, none of it matters. Everything's just made up as we go. It's just like whatever is convenient, what we need in that scene at that moment, that is what Alex is writing in. There's no like, like logical continuity. It's just nonsense. Everything's made up and nothing matters. So her and Oro start to go on these like escapades, right? Where he says, I want to find the heart of the island. I think that somebody wielded the heart and that was the original offense that led to the curses. Okay. So we go on these little journeys with them where they're trying and failing to find the heart. They're having these conversations along the way. And it feels very much like he is sort of like, this 50 year old man who's sort of like Geralt right to her Siri. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one comparison like some books that plagiarize but it feels sort of like that like mentor mentee almost father figure dynamic because she expresses no romantic interest in him at all whereas with Grimdark every time they're in a scene together she's like oh he's so annoying but also like I can't help these feelings every time he touches me it's electricity and also like I kind of want to kiss him. I shouldn't be thinking about that oh my god. And it's like oh okay so clearly we have like here's her girlfriend Celeste, here's her love interest, and here's her you know like mentor, right? So one of them has to be the one to betray her. More on that in a second. So her and Oro are going and they're not finding the heart. She eventually like comes clean to him and says I don't actually have any powers. The next day he has a meeting with everybody, all six rulers. Have you forgotten their names? Because I'm I'm blanking right now. <laughs> And he says, I'm switching partners because this bitch doesn't have any powers. And she's like, oh. 
and you know like I laughed honestly but like you know that he hasn't actually done anything wrong and it's been so heavy-handed where it's like is he gonna betray me is he gonna betray me is he gonna betray me that you know this can't possibly be real because if it were then she would have done it the opposite way where it's like I've trusted you the whole time now I've been betrayed instead it was like he's gonna betray me the whole time now I've been betrayed so that means logically right that the person that she says will never betray her will be the one to betray her have you guessed it yet at this point I did I'll get there in a second so <laughs> because that's that's how these heavy-handed authors write like it's just so oh my god it's so stupid okay so her and Oro aren't so he teams up with Cleo who's like her enemy so bad so evil even though they never had a conversation and so she's still trying to like find the bond breaker and find the heart Grimdark has started to like majorly make it obvious that he's like obsessed with her and he gives her this necklace and he's like anytime you need me you just hold it and I'll show up for you and it's like wow that's convenient <laughs> Of course you will! Of course! So he, she gets into trouble a bunch of times and, and has to be saved by different people. Here's the thing. So she gets, <laughs> gets into it with Celeste, right? And Celeste like freezes her and she was, she's like, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, you accuse me of being the bad guy. You're a dumb, stupid bitch. Bye. And she like leaves her there. <laughs> I was like, yeah, leave her. <laughs> And it's uh, it's like painfully obvious that, Cel that Cleo is not the bad guy, right? Did I say Celeste? Fuck, why did she make two C names? I hate that. As if this one wasn't like fucking stupid and convoluted and confusing as it is. So Cleo dips, like leaves her there to frost to death. And then she gets woken up and like these people who are called like Vinderlings, who apparently used to be wildlings, which she is, are like about to eat her or some shit. So Oro, the king who betrayed her, shows up and she's like, oh, he saved me. And he was like, I was just trying to get Cleo to help me. I didn't actually betray you. And she's like, oh, okay. He's like, yeah. But then they go like right back to the old dynamic where it's like sort of like he's very standoffish. It's like a mentor mentee relationship, almost like a father figure. And it's like, what is this supposed to be? Like, this is the most awkward, right? I thought she was failing to write a friendship mentee relationship. Um, she was failing to write something but it wasn't that apparently and I didn't find out until the very end so anyway Grimdark is just fucking around like not really doing anything uh Celeste is like we have to find the bond breaker and <laughs> oh my god okay she where do I even go from here okay Celeste gets poisoned and I was like yeah sure um <laughs> and she's like Azul the the black guy, the only gay character, the only black and gay character, did it. And I was like, no, there's no fucking way. Celeste is the bad guy. Um, and she like is holding something in her hand and it's like a diamond ring that somebody had given to Azul. And it's like, like a very like Hermione moment where it's like, oh, she's holding the thing and she's frozen in place. And I was like, wow, this, this feels very, very Harry Potter right now. <laughs> And what ends up happening is that Grimdark magically <laughs> finds an old wildling, wildling elixir in like an abandoned building and gives it to Celeste and wakes her up. And I was like, again, we have a convenient thing, magical item in the plot that just happens to... Good for us, yet again. First the skin gloves, now the double-sided needle, now the wildling elixir. We just, whenever we need something, here, here Alex is to slip it right in. It's so stupid. Here's the thing though, Azul didn't poison Celeste. Celeste was the bad guy. Celeste was not Celeste at all. What ends up happening is that they do find the heart. Initially, oh man, this is convoluted, so stay with me. Okay, Isla, our main character, finds the heart, feels all this magic, gets shot through her own heart with an arrow. Somehow that got that gets healed. Grimdark came and portaled her away. Then she goes to Celeste and she's like, Celeste, I know where the bond breaker is. They go to the bond breaker and it turns out, even though Oro literally said there is no such thing as a bond breaker, if there was, I would have found it and used it already. They go, she go <laughs> she goes and she touches the bond breaker and Celeste touches the other side. Remember, it's a double-sided needle. So they're over here like this, right? And fucking Celeste is like, hey, 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 hey. I'm actually evil. She steals all of Isla's powers. Oro and Darkling, no. Grimdark show up and they're like, no, what have you done? And <laughs> I'm like, damn, I called this so hard. You know what I did not call them? Um, apparently this entire fucking time, Oro was a love interest. What? What? No. I thought 
thought she was poorly writing a weird age gap friendship dynamic. Instead she was poorly writing another love interest who is quite clearly the Tamlin to the Resand. Like what? Because Celeste like ties, she has all of Isla's powers. Isla apparently had powers this whole fucking time but they've been dampened because her mom was a wildling but her dad was a darkling. No, Nightshade. Which one like dampened the other. Uh, apparently Celeste like killed her parents I think. No, Celeste got her caretakers to kill her parents. Celeste knew Grimdark. Grimdark knew Isla. Oro wasn't in on it but the rest of these bitches were. Or Oro and Grimdark are both like I love you and it's like what the f- this is so me that that 50 year old man was running around as a love interest this whole time. Where was the chemistry? This bitch had sex with Grimdark out of fucking nowhere. Well, I, they fooled around. And she's been thinking about him non-fucking-stop and then all of a sudden she loves Oro? Since when? That's a lie! That's a lie! That is here just to cause you to have like a tumultuous ending so that she can finally get back to the love interest that anybody, everybody actually wants. Which I said because eventually I found this TikTok by Alex which was fairly recent and it's like no you did not write a love triangle. You wrote a romance and then you were like hey by the way this guy's actually interested in Isla. And at the end what ends up happening is like Isla fights Celeste. She wins. She uses the bomb breaker again. Gets all of everybody's powers out of that needle thing. It's so stupid. Celeste was actually Aurora who spun the original curses, got Isla's parents killed, Grimdark did some shit behind Isla's back. It was so stupid and at the end Grim leaves because Isla's mad at him. She, he goes back to Nightshade and Oro and Isla are together and you're like I am fucking losing it. You fuck that you're gaslighting me. You're gaslighting me because there was no chemistry or love between these two but suddenly because of the way she writes her magic if you love somebody you can tap into their power and they can tap into yours and she's like we could do that with each other because we love each other. Bitch since when? Since when? There was no chemistry between those two. They were barely even, barely even friends. No, not not the romantic kind. Barely even friends isn't barely even tolerating each other. And I was so confused. Like what the fuck? It was so stupid. And it made it like so much even less enjoyable because I was like, is this leading to something like, I don't know, like I, I I'm your real father or like um, I'm your mentor and like I'm gonna teach you to bring out your wildling powers. No. He he loved her and she loved him back? Bullshit! Bullshit! The only reason that that exists was so that in the next book something stupid will happen and she'll be like I choose Grimdark. We know because it's not a love triangle. That's that's the recent and Oro is the Tamlin. That's it. That's all this is. There's no love triangle. There's no wondering who will she choose. This is not legend boy. This is a legend war where you're like, oh my god, I actually don't know who she's going to choose. No, it's not. It turned out that her and Rhysand, whatever, Grimdark, had like a relationship before he had erased her memories, literally right before she left to go to the Centennial. That is who she initially used her star stick to go see. And Celeste was, you know, plotting this whole time, which was very obvious with the way that she writes. And yeah, so what did we learn? Oh boy. We learned that Alex Astor wrote a book with the most stupid plot <laughs> with the most predictable like villain arcs and the only thing that threw me was the random out of nowhere love triangle at the end. I was shocked and also very annoyed and I still am and I don't like people coming to my comments and being like that's a stretch for him to be a father figure. No it's fucking not. You tell me where in this book they had chemistry. Go on. I'll wait. No that was not a love interest that was thrown in at the last literally the last fucking three chapters which they are incredibly short by the way suddenly he's a love interest when he's been like a father figure mentor like reluctant ally the entire time there was no chemistry there there was nothing she wasn't into him and then suddenly she's in love with him at the end I don't fucking think so 
that's a lie. That is a device. She gaslit me so that she could do a love triangle in the next book. And she didn't even set it up beforehand. That was like a last minute play of fucking Hail Mary at the end of the book where she was like, ooh, 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 wait, 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 wait. I kind of want to write a love triangle. So it just got like shoved in there at the last second. I hate it. So stupid. It, it, it made the book worse, actually. It was already bad. The prose was bad. She, everything was described meanly and yokey and... <laughs> as food. I still don't understand how the ocean is soup. Every single person's plot arc was very predictable. It was obvious Celeste was a villain. It was obvious Cleo was being villainized. Azul got thrown in the background and only utilized when it was time to throw you off the scent again of both Cleo and Celeste. What was the fucking point of literally any of this? Any of it. Magic system doesn't make sense. Prose is bad. I guess the curses are broken, but like who fucking cares? Like who fucking cares? And also there was like a hint that Grim dark is somehow holding back something worse than the curses and it's like you know what's worse than the curses reading this fucking book anyway that's what happened um she ended up with the sun king her father figure she ended up calling daddy <laughs> grimdark not recent will end up you know probably boning her in the next book i'm sure she'll leave and it'll be like a hades persephone thing just like a court of mist and fury uh and it'll be shit <laughs> Uh, Ilo once again has no woman friends because why? Why would we possibly write a woman for her to relate to that was not a villain? Why would we do that? Why would we do that? Also, the exploration of the topics of like calling indigenous folks savages and having a conversation about the, you know, the spicy, sexy Latina stereotype, just gone. Just, just <laughs> gone. <laughs> no conversation. Instead, we got a Hail Mary love triangle out of fucking nowhere. Everything about this was bad. It absolutely deserved one star. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. I hated it. It was so, here's the thing. It was just like not an enjoyable reading experience. There are some books where it's like stupid fun. This is not stupid fun. It's just stupid. Just like Caraval. But if you like Caraval, you might like this. So there you go. There was my review. Um, I absolutely hated it. Uh, I wish that I, uh, like the sun, could disintegrate into a yokey thing and forget everything that happened in this book. <laughs> Will I read the next one? Yeah, probably because I like making content for you all, so great. Anyway, let me know what you uh, thought of as the disco stick. Nope, uh, star stick. Let me know what you pictured and if I've absolutely implanted this in your brain permanently. <laughs> I think in the next book, I, I don't even know where it's gonna go other than we're gonna get some like Hades and Persephone shit her, you know, fighting feelings for Grimdark while trying to cultivate a romance with Oro, who she absolutely has no fucking chemistry with, despite being in love with. I'm still mad at being gaslit. I'm still mad. And, uh, you know, Celeste is dead, so there's that. Maybe Azul will actually get a fucking character arc instead of just existing for diversity points. That's it. That's all I have to say about this stupid ass fucking book. God, I wish I could forget. But, you know, just like Grimdark said to Alex, you'll be back. Or Isla, you'll be back. Alex is saying that's me. Because I will. I'll be back. I'll be back for more of her bad writing. You know, there is the possibility that she could do better. Like, Caraval didn't get better. Uh, people tell me that the next book was better. It's not. I read it. It's terrible. It ha it makes no fucking sense. Um, maybe the next one will make some fucking sense. Maybe Alex will... I could have hope. I could be hopeful. She could decide to, you know, take some of the feedback. Write better. <laughs> Yeah, I doubt it, but it could happen. You know, stranger things have happened. Okay, that's it. Let me know your thoughts down below. If you want to subscribe to my channel, you can do that. Uh, like, subscribe. My Patreon is down below. Or you can buy me a coffee to tip me for reading this shit book. Okay, thanks. See you next time. Bye. I'm gonna draw a puddle of stars and jet on out of here. <laughs>